Thank you all for joining us this evening for our virtual event with Jeb and Allison Bechdel in celebration of the republication of Jeb's book, Eye to Eye, Portraits of Lesbians. I'm Lynn Mooney, co-owner of Women and Children First. We begin our virtual events the same way we used to begin our in-store events, and that is with a land acknowledgement. Please join me in taking a moment to acknowledge that the land on which the bookstore stands is the occupied unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. The harm of that violent taking of land reverberates forward and backward through time and generations. We all have a place at the table in the work of addressing that harm. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgements and about the rightful owners of the land where you are this evening by going to the website native-land.ca. Speaking of our brick and mortar store, we're open. That's noteworthy, wow. we're delighted to be open. Um, we're open every day except Mondays from noon to six. Even though the store is open for shopping, we do continue to do our events virtually. So please follow us on social media so you don't miss anything we have coming up. Uh, one that I wanna, one event I wanna give a shout out to is next week we'll be hosting Gina Frangello, Frangello here uh, on Tuesday, April 6th for her new memoir, Blow Your House Down, a story of family, feminism and treason. Just like tonight, you can sign up for that event on Eventbrite and see it on our Crowdcast channel. Now a few tips about tonight. Please use the ask a question button to post any question you have for either author. And also notice the buy the book button at the bottom of your screen. And do feel free to applaud Jeb and Allison anytime you want to. <laughs> okay, um, let's go into it. Jeb or Joan Byron is an internationally recognized documentary artist and activist. Her book, Eye to Eye, Portraits of Lesbians was first published, self-published in 1979 and was revolutionary at that time. Jeb's fierce but tender images showed lesbians of different ages and backgrounds in their everyday lives. It moved lesbian lives from the margins to the center, a start at reversing a long history of invisibility and helped propel a political movement. The questions raised by her images are astoundingly current today from body positivity and polyamory to black power and the womanist movement. This new edition includes not only new essays, but also a completely updated notes section with references to such recent works as Leah Lakshmi Pepsa, Pepsna's Samarish, I am so sorry, Samarashana's Care Work and Roxane Gay's Memoir Hunger. I also want to introduce Alison Bechdel, who is a cartoonist whose work includes the long running comic strip Dykes to Watch Out For, as well as the graphic novels Fun Home and Are You My Mother. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a MacArthur Fellowship. Her next book, The Secret to Superhuman Strength will be out May 4th, just a little bit more than a month from now. We are really excited about it. And of course, if any of you would be interested in pre-ordering it, we'd be happy to help you with that. Um, I also want to quickly acknowledge we have additional help tonight um, from Debbie Richards and also from Casey of Anthology Publications who is helping with the PowerPoint. Um, so now I'm going to turn over my camera and mic and enjoy the evening with the rest of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lynn, and thank uh, everybody at Women and Children First, also Sarah, uh, Casey Whalen from uh, Anthology Editions, who is going to help us with the images, and my friend Debbie Richards, who's going to put a lot of, I hope, very helpful links in the chat uh, for you. I am coming to you from less than eight miles away from the U.S. Capitol, uh, still uh, full of armed uh, National Guards people. And I'm sitting here on unceded Piscataway land. And I am so excited. 
excited and thrilled that so many of you have joined us. And I am beyond happy that Allison agreed to have this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Allison. So uh, Jeb, I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Um, I am logging in from Vermont, the unceded land of the Abenaki people. Um, I, I'm so excited to celebrate the 40th anniversary of this book. I just have to tell a little story, <laughs> okay? okay? Um, it was 1980, I was 19, I was in college. Yeah. I had been with my first girlfriend for about three months, so that meant we were moving in together. <laughs> and um, it was right around that time that I discovered this book in the in the campus bookstore. And my my girlfriend and I each bought a copy of it for the other, even though we couldn't afford to buy two copies of this book. It was, God, it was eight ninety five. Yeah. But the reason we needed two copies is because one of them was to look at and the other one was to cut up so we could put the images on the walls of our little apartment. Um, we were just blown away by these pictures. Um, somehow, I don't know how I lucked out. I got to keep the intact copy. <laughs> it's got her, it's still got her signature in it with all these like little double women's symbols on it. Um, but these, these images were, salvational to me as a young person. Um, I was riveted by the women in this book. I looked at them over and over again, the way I realized later that I would look at my actual family albums, like looking at my ancestors and relatives and trying to figure out who I was. Um, and this, this, this book showed me who I was in a much deeper way. Um, they, the photos filled some kind of deep hunger that I hadn't even realized I was feeling. Um, they were a mirror, a, a reflection of myself that I didn't see anywhere else. And I just want to say that looking at the book now, 40 years later, I, I'm even more appreciative of the, the radical work you were doing just in the way it's organized. Um, I wasn't really aware of that when I was 19. It was just like, I just accepted this new world view. But can we cue up, Casey, the, the, the cover photo? Um, we have this little slide presentation we're gonna do. So um, the two women on the cover exchanging this sultry, erotic gaze are, are old. <laughs> They're old women. One of them has a little beard, this <laughs> awesome little beard. Uh, the very first photo in the book is of two black women. And they're not the only women of color in the book. There are disabled women and martial artists. <laughs> There's a, a trio of, uh, there, there are lots of older women in, in the book, like Mabel Hampton. Th this trio of women who look like somebody's grandmothers who are now what we, in what we would call a polyamorous relationship. Um, so wherever all these women were hanging out, it was a very, inclusive place. These pictures showed me that there was a place for me in the world. And, and actually very, very soon after getting the book, I, I went to the women, Michigan Women's Music Festival for the first time and I, I, I entered that world. I found out it was a real place. Um, and not that summer, but another summer at Michigan, I met one of these women in this picture, Mocha in the background with her shirt off. Um, <laughs> And I, it was just amazing to me to go through my life actually meeting some of the people in, in the book. Um, I, I, I met one of those women on the cover at another music festival, Katie, axe maker to the queen. She was selling labrises. Um, I found myself in a karate class with, with Wendy Dragonfire. Uh, so I met a bunch of these women and every time I did it was, there was this wonderful sense of, of homecoming. But then I got to meet Jeb herself yes. in the mid 1990s. Um, we got to spend time together doing a, some talks and hanging out and really getting to know each other. And it was a very wonderful uh, experience to get to do that. Um, I just want to <laughs> apologize to Jeb. I just realized that 
I have been completely plagiarizing her lately. I've been I've been seeing this line about my own work that I I didn't see images of people like me, so I decided I would just start drawing them. I, I totally stole that from you, Jeb, and I'm sorry. Except I said except drawing. You're you drawing them, so it's not the same. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and I, I I also ripped you off in another way. I in my new book, I draw very heavily on that the same Adrian Rich poem that your title comes from, um, ah. uh, tr Transcendental Etude, Indeed. Um, which is an amazing poem about transformation. And it's about, I don't know, it's about everything in the world, but um, mm -hmm. I, I just wanna say, I ripped you off by stealing that poem too. Um, <laughs> Adrienne belongs to all of us, I might say. Okay. Everybody, everybody should read Transcendental Etude. Yes. So the poem is about transformation. It's about self-transformation, but also societal transformation, I think. And I, so I just want to end my little intro by thanking you for the particular societal transformation that, that you have wrought. Um, I know many other people were working on it at the same time, but these photographs were taken through your lens. Uh, they're, they're your images. Um, can we just show the next image, which I think is the snapshot I took? <laughs> I was I was walking down the street in New York a couple years ago. This the um, one, yeah. It was the fortieth, the fiftieth anniversary of of Stonewall, and I turned a corner in Soho and saw these larger than life prints of Jeb's photos and I, I was just staggered. There's Jeb on the corner of something and something. Um, you know, it was amazing to, to just see these photographs that are already emblazoned in my own hippocampus, you know, taking up this whole block of a New York City street. Um, it was an incredible moment. So that's all I have to say for now, I'm just really honored to get to be here with you tonight, Jeb, and to talk about this book four decades after you self-published it. Thank you so much, Allison. I couldn't um, pick anybody I would rather have uh, say something I had said, and <laughs> I don't in any way feel ripped off. I feel very flattered, as they okay. say. Um, what, what should we talk about first? Well, I think I need to tell the story that's probably going to make me cry so I can have that over with. Okay. Okay. And this is about the meaning of your work to me. So it seems nice for me to reciprocate. You know, having done this uh, book so long ago, I have had a lot of years of lesbians telling me how meaningful it was to them and how in the same way that, that you said, they did find a reflection of themselves in it. They felt seen, they, they felt affirmed. And you know, when somebody tells you that about your work, it's a wonderful thing. And that's really why I do the work, why I did this work. And then something happened that made me realize I didn't understand what these people were saying to me until um, approximately almost to the day six years ago at Circle in the Square Theater where Fun Home the Musical was playing and um, the young Allison sang Ring of Keys. I do the butch cry. Everybody who knows me knows I'm one of those crying butches <laughs> and I don't care. It moved me very much and I know it's a song that moves all kinds of people, you know. And I know that, that the musical was made um, uh, by uh, 
Jean Tresori and Lisa Cron, but it is you, it is your story. It is your life that you shared with us. And it was your knowing the moment that you recognized this Butch Dyke in this luncheonette with your father. And I have thought about this and, and why it makes me cry. And I can't figure out if I'm the young Allison or if I'm the Butch Dyke who walks in to the luncheonette. And I think I'm both of those people. And I think I'm recognizing myself, recognizing myself, and it's sort of meta. And it is something I had never felt before. And I think it is something that people have been trying to tell me that they feel. And thank you for letting me feel that. And I want to say that it is, well, I have to, I have a, always, I have visual props. So here's to that. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I never buy swag on Broadway, but I did. <laughs> and um, I think that what it shows is, as you as you also said, the transformational abilities of art, that what art can do to transform the way we see ourselves and having been transformed, you know, become part of something to change the world so that it accepts us in a different way. And that's what I wanna ask you about. I mean, when you also do representations of our community, which are enormously inclusive, but much easier because you don't have to travel all over the country to find them. <laughs> uh, you know, I know that that takes a certain consciousness. And I wanted to ask you, when you think about representation, what, what do you think about? You're so sly, Jeb. You just try to turn it back on me. You know, this is, we're, we're here to talk about you tonight, but I will try and answer this question. Okay. No, we're here to about? have a conversation. Okay. Yes. Yes. We're here to talk about representation and inclusivity. Um, I mean, I just think about, honestly, the way I felt when I saw myself in your work, that's a great feeling. Wouldn't, I bet other people feel like that too, you know? So, mm -hmm. Um, as I started creating the world of my comic strip, I just tried to get lots of different people in there. And when when I would be, be criticized for, um, somebody once called my comic strip, multicultural to a fault. <laughs> mm. I thought that was great. I figured yeah. I must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the more the merrier. I just, uh, you know, it's interesting too though, because um, I was, I was representing all different kinds of people of color and differently abled people, people who I might not have, you know, the the situation now is kind of different. Like you have to be more careful about the way you're including people who are not like you in your work. Like you, I mean, yeah. one should always be careful, but I, there was probably a little more latitude when I was getting started. I think it's mm -hmm. pe people are, um, maybe a little more skittish, but I wish that they wouldn't be that we just have to keep trying this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the pre-digital world that we all once lived in. <laughs> and what just, I, you know, it's, it's easy to be nostalgic about that world and all the, I don't know, the Xerox copies we were making or the photo stats or the, you know, the film canisters we're shipping from city to city to have a, a festival. Yeah. Uh, what what do, you, do you feel like we've lost anything um, in, in this new digital world that we're living in just by losing the materiality of all that stuff? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I, I'll tell you one thing. I loved working in the dark room. I loved smelling the chemicals and getting my hands 
in the chemicals, all these toxic things that are not good for you, I really enjoyed. And when uh, photography became digital is when I switched to video making and filmmaking. I never, except now with my phone, like everybody else, did any digital photography. And that was partly coincidental with my also wanting to do some something more collaborative. And at that point, filmmaking you did with other people and uh, still photography is a very solo thing. But I am a tactile person. So I love that everything is digital because it's so easy in a certain sense. It's quick, it's easy. You, you, you know, you see the photograph that you're making before you release the shutter, but you've lost the magic of being in this dark room and waiting to see if on the film is the thing you, you hope would be on the film and seeing the image, uh, you know, in the, the print, you know, come up. I mean, there's a lot of magic that now you can digitally create magic, but the magic of making it is not the same, I think. Um, and as a tactile person, I do miss, you know, some of those things, but the, the advantages of digital are, are very great. And on the, and, you know, Labyrinth, to the sword with two edges. The other edge, of course, I am a supporter of the Electronic Frontier Foundation because when everything is digital, not much is private. And I think that is a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't answer your question, did I? That's okay. Uh I want to ask a slightly related question, which is, um, I feel like you and I have both engaged in this process of like crisscrossing the country, carrying a very heavy slide projector. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, that physical experience of community of like going from little subcultural lesbian community to little subcultural lesbian community. And, and in the process, building that community, was kind of um, an, an amazing experience. Do you have, have any thoughts on that? I had two slide projectors. God. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, at least it would balance the And balance four you carousels oh and, and a little thing that controlled the dissolve between the two carousels. Wow. And a stand for all of them to go on. It was it was epic. And um, <laughs> <laughs> my experience, uh, you know, I stayed in some of the strangest places because when you're going from little subcultural lesbian community <laughs> to little subcultural lesbian community and nobody has the money to put you in a motel, you stay with people in the community. And at that time, I think it's changed. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong. At that time, all lesbians had cats. I believe now most lesbians have dogs. I do not understand how that changed. But I think that's accurate. I am allergic to cats. And <laughs> I asked oh dear. to stay in houses of lesbians without cats. And those lesbians, if any of you are out there, I apologize in advance <laughs> for saying this, were so strange that I went back to staying in the houses with the cats. <laughs> Whew, that's yeah. interesting. Yes, and it is the answer to one of the questions that somebody put in that question box before we started was where to find community now. 
And the answer is you have to build it just the same way that we built it. It wasn't there for us to just go to. We made it happen. And if it doesn't exist for you where you are now, you have to make it happen. And, you know, put in the chat your name and where you live and get Lesbian Connection and find out all the other lesbians, you know, who live where you live and start doing things. And that's how you build community. But Jeb, don't you think it's different now? Like part of why, why there was the cohesiveness in the old days that we don't seem to have now is just because it was necessary. Like the, the outside world was that much more hostile. I think that's the part we forget when we look nostalgically back. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> mm -hmm. There was good reason to like hunker down together. Well, yes, I agree. And the community was smaller. We needed each other more. And there weren't places for us in the, what we even called the outside world, you know? And um, I think that, I mentioned this to you before, I think that now people can understand a little bit more what that was like because during the pandemic, there isn't a place for uh, anybody in the outside world. You, you can't, you know, go to these, places you usually went to. But when we were lesbians, we could not go to those places and find ourselves there. You know, we couldn't go to a restaurant and hold hands uh, with our loved one, you know, so we ate at home, right? So that's what's going on now for people. That's but so interesting. I think um, that it is true that there's an enormous amount of nostalgia that does not take into account the side of existence then that was unpleasant for many reasons. And I have tried to explain this to some younger people because there's no way for younger people to understand yeah, our it's really history impossible unless we tell it, them, it. right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think it's right to say part of why we had um, music festivals and conferences and our own restaurants and our own bookstores to a much greater extent. Oh, look, I think I have something to put up here. Could we start with uh, number 23, please, Casey? So, you know, we needed these spaces because there weren't other spaces for us. So this is how many women's bookstores existed. Wait, could we go? Yeah. Wow, that's a great map. Yeah. And, so you know, this was a map. I forget which bookstore it was in, but, you know, I made a picture of it because that's what I do. And the thing about bookstores, and I know this because I was partnered with a bookstore owner uh, in Washington, D.C. for five years at Lamas. They are sort of the de facto women's center and lesbian center of the community. So now we can go to 24. And this is a real bulletin board, unlike a digital bulletin board in a <laughs> women's bookstore. You know, that says awesome. uh, lesbian rap group, lesbian therapy group, women's group, American women in history. You know, you can work in class women, this, you know, and that's how people found each other. And we also had, we can go to 25, um, many, many publications. This happens to be somebody... Uh, putting out Lesbian Connection, which we still have, uh, that comes from Lansing, Michigan. But we had, and we still have Sinister Wisdom, and we still have a number of wonderful uh, periodicals, but we had tons of periodicals 
and newspapers because this was the other way that we found each other and built community. And we can go to 26. And this is um, from uh, the National Women's Studies Association, which lesbians sort of adopted their conference as a way <laughs> of meeting each other. This is Cheryl Clark with Conditions Magazine. But for many, many years, the National Women's Studies Association was the place that academics and grassroots activists um, interacted with each other. And of course, tons of the activists were lesbians. Um, so anyway, and then Michigan Women's Music Festival, which is the next slide. So, the, you know, we had these things because we needed them to find each other and to build community and to create this wonderful culture, which then was kind of um, assimilated, you know, into mainstream culture. So there was less of a need for us to have our own presses and our own bookstores. But I think we did lose something in that. So I'm going to turn it back on you. What do you think we lost? Well, I rem I'm remembering the conversations that I was having with you in the mid 90s when this process of assimilation seemed to really be getting getting ahead of steam. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like what was being lost was authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I learned so much from you about how this machinery works. I could actually envision a big kind of cultural machine that sucks up interesting cultural traits from a subculture, grinds out anything truly threatening to the larger system and spits out a little package that the people in that community can then buy, you know? And yeah. so it's it's that chaff, that grist that gets spat out that is the, the is the real stuff that that gets lost, I think. I do think that. I think um I wanted to read you and I wrote it down here, um a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King who we know was against wars and economic inequalities. And n nobody talks about that part of his politics anymore. You know, right. he, he himself as a historical figure has been through the assimilationist grinder. And I think he understood that because he said, I fear I am integrating my people into a burning house which just, you never hear that quote either, you know? Yeah. And I think we as lesbians integrated ourselves into a burning house because we're no longer outlaws, which is literally outside the law, which is a good thing, but we're a lot less fabulous, you know, <laughs> in a way. And, and that, that authenticity uh, is is hard to maintain. And I want to talk a little bit about the kind of visibility we have now. But before we do that, I want to read a wonderful <laughs> cartoon from Allison that I asked her to barter with me to gift me this original, I have the original hanging in my house for all these years and um, gave her a, a photo. And we're going to read you this part of this cartoon, starting uh, Casey with number 16. <laughs> okay, we're going to read a cartoon to you guys. This was yeah. from 1992. That's when this was written. That's it's, um, I, I'll just set the scene. It's the women at the bookstore in my comic strip having a conversation in the back room. Okay, so Lois says, one day dental dams are de rigueur, the next I find out they're sex negative. Well, I'm trying to decide whether to get my nose pierced, 
putting rings through your labia becomes the thing to do. I tell you, I can't keep up anymore. I know that feeling. When I opened this store 15 years ago, I carried three dozen lesbian titles. Now we have nearly a thousand. There's barely time to order them, let alone read anything. Yeah, I used to feel like I was riding the wave, but now I'm just floundering in the surf. Some days so, I get so fried. Nope, oh, sorry, sorry. Is, you go. That's yeah. you. <laughs> I, I'm two different people, but I, I'll do the voices like I do for my granddaughter. <laughs> Some days I get so fried from trying to keep up with all the new magazines and music and videos and catalogs we get here. I just want to go home and watch straight people on TV. But no. There's fags and dykes and all the talk shows and half the sitcoms. <laughs> CBS interviewing queer cops, ABC investigating lesbian visibility. Jeez, we're visible now? Well, that is what we've been fighting for. But I kind of miss the days when our culture was small and manageable and we had it all to ourselves. Yeah, now it's like a big obstreperous teenager making a nuisance down at the mall. Maybe I'll get my navel pierced. <laughs> Um, thanks for dragging that out of the archive. I love it. And it is a little bit of a shout out to women and children first. <laughs> um, I, let's talk about visibility. You know, um, yeah. it just, I just want to mention it's National Transgender Day of Visibility, which Biden told us about today. So that's pretty awesome. But sometimes I wonder, do you ever do you ever regret making lesbians visible? I, I you know I sometimes I don't seriously regret that, but it's just like this cartoon that we've been talking about. Something something gets lost when a thing gets very widely disseminated. Um, I I I just want to talk a little bit about the amazing. Um, proto selfie that you have at the beginning of your book. Can we put that image up? Um, I think it's very hard to convey to young people nowadays what what a, and what an what an image desert it was in the 1970s. Um, and how when Jeb, when you wanted to see a, a photo of two women kissing, you had to you had to go take it yourself. Um, yeah. On I film. Could not find it and you used the word hunger earlier, and I think there was a visceral hunger that I had to see an image of women kissing, and so I had to make it, and it started me on this wonderful road of being a photographer, but, um, you know, the, the truth Oh, I lost my train of thought because I had two other things I was going to say to you before that. Well, so that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll let me back say the other things. Can I say the other thing? Yeah. Okay. Do whatever you so, want. First of all, I wanted to talk about um, the we. Uh, that's enough of me kissing Sharon. But <laughs> I love that. I love that picture. Um, <laughs> I still love it. I still love Sharon. Um, the uh, Trans Day of Visibility, I want to discuss because trans people, more than any other LGBTQ plus people, have uh, a problem with visibility because if you are visibly trans, especially if you are visibly a black trans woman, you are going to attract a lot of violence. And a lot of people are killed because of being visible in, in that way. So that is your definite double-edged sword uh, of visibility. And it is 
less true, but still true of lesbians and other, you know, LGBTQ people back in the days when we started making people visible, there was still a lot of risks, which is why it was so difficult for me to get people who wanted to agree to be in this book and why there was not a book like this before I made one, because you could lose your children, your families could throw you out and shun you, you could lose housing and jobs and everything. So there is a danger to visibility. The other danger is when you become very visible, you can find each other because you can't organize from inside a closet and you can make a movement and you can start to gain rights and then you're gonna get pushback from all the people who have made themselves so very evident in yeah. during the last presidency. Because, so, you know, hiding is terrible and it, you gain so much when you can live an authentic out life but there are dangers. That's one part of the visibility. The second part about visibility is because of the assimilation that we had already talked about, you get a watered down visibility. In other words, the main things that lesbians have had to identify with are Ellen and the L word. And that is not a huge step forward, you know, from the young, white, slim, over-romanticized lesbians that I found on everybody's walls before they had the book to tear apart and put <laughs> on their walls. They would put David Hamilton pictures oh, on. Oh, God, that's awful. David and they were, and that, but, they're, but we haven't moved that far from that in many ways. And that uh -huh. that is the problem with visibility now is that the most marginalized parts of our communities, you know, the BIPOC people, the disabled people, the fat people, the immigrant people, the butchist people, you know, the non-conforming gender people, we don't see them in the proportion that they exist. Right. That was very beautifully put. Thank you so much. Um, it remind it brings me to my next question, which is, um, I heard you talk to Sarah Schulman last week. It was a very wonderful conversation. But um, when she asked you, you were talking about why you became a photographer. And I was, yeah. I was kind of startled by your answer. You said that the feminists you were hanging out with when you were young, saw your very fancy education. You'd been to Mount Holyoke and had studied at Oxford. Um, saw that really as a liability. Um, and, yeah. and even your Jewish socialization, the, where you were, had learned to you know, speak up and take a stand on things, um, was seen as somehow giving you this unfair verbal advantage. And these, these very radical, feminists encouraged you to not use your words quite so much. <laughs> and that's why you chose pictures. I think that's fascinating. Well, there was part of it that I agreed with and, you know, part of it that in retrospect, I think was possibly anti-Semitic, but in the sense that I did have this in, incredibly privileged education. I had, we, we, did I say when I was talking to Sarah that we called it prick in the head? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it was a shorthand way of saying that our minds and our thinking had been colonized by men and because we had learned so much in patriarchal institutions. And in the same way that all of the images that we saw came from the straight white male gaze, you know, did not come from us. 
in the same way my thinking came from those people. So I should find a new tool because we were starting everything over. We were turning everything inside out. We were going to make a revolution. And um, as Audre Lorde told us later, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And that is why I taught myself photography because I did. I wanted to do it in a way that was not influenced um, by the master who I was trying to overthrow. And one of the things that happened is that I spent an awful lot of time filled with self-doubt <laughs> about whether I was doing things the right way or not, or whether there couldn't there be easier ways to do these things. And now I think, yeah, I, I did it my way. And, you know, thank you, Frank Sinatra, it worked. <laughs> it did work. <laughs> but it was hard. It wasn't easy. No one was like um, using the path, really. Uh, but did you teach yourself to draw? You did, right? Well, uh, more or less, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what all cartoonists did. Cartooning didn't have as much formal structure as photography did. So it wasn't that odd to teach yourself to draw comics. Well, but here's an interesting thing. You know, photography was not accepted as an art either. And graphic mm -hmm. novels were not accepted as literature. Yeah, and that was you, exciting to me. You broke that, you broke that barrier down. Well, I did, but I, an amazing I, thing. I mean, I, I was part of that happening, but I also learned from you and people like you to be quite skeptical about the fine arts. I, you know, I didn't think of myself as an artist for a very long time. I I thought of cartooning as being a kind of cultural work, that something more aligned with journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, you know, it, it just, it was uncool to be an artist. Artists were elitist jerks. <laughs> That's right. That's why I had my, my um, images in the windows of the museum facing out, and I didn't take the show of putting them inside because I still think, you know, a lot of people don't go into museums. And it's unfortunate because now, you know, there's a lot of good things in museums. <laughs> but um, I think the fact that we both saw ourselves, because I thought of myself as a photojournalist, and you thought, because our work was appearing in community newspapers and magazines. And I remember, <laughs> you know, I showed that picture of the woman with the press with lesbian connection they uh -huh. they used to staple do you remember when they used to oh staple my god it was connection. stapled with like 40 staples per yeah. issue that's because, because god forbid the postman would accidentally see what the title of this folded up periodical was yeah and it, it had a plain cover and it was stapled to death and it had <laughs> and it had allison's cartoons in it. And um, because people were afraid that their neighbors or their housemates or whoever it was would find out they were lesbians and something bad might happen. And, you know, the lesbian connection was protecting <laughs> its readers. And it changed eventually. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we were, that's where our work was appearing was my point. So yeah. naturally, it wasn't appearing in museums at that point. It, your work does appear in museums now, correct? Uh, cartoon museums. But Jeb, do, should we open up to questions where it's, it's yeah, nine? Yeah, sure. Let's, Let's do that. Um, okay. But I, I, I can't read them, you read them. Yeah, I'm gonna read them. Don't you pay it, don't bother okay. your pretty head. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna start with, this one, most of our communal gathering spaces 
from days of lesbian slash rainbow your dyke bars, feminist bookstores, et cetera, have shut down. We try to support those that remain, but outside of that, where and how do you advise folks seeking community and representation to find that community these days? What are some of your own favorite go-to resources for places virtual and live that you are hearing, seeing, experiencing? Lesbian, queer, rainbow community and stories being shared and well-preserved right now. Well, right now, because of the pandemic, there's so much virtual going on and anybody anywhere can access these um, virtual events like the one we're in now. So check all the still existing feminist bookstores, you know, Google feminist bookstores, you'll get a name, all the names of them, and then check out all the events that they're doing which are wonderful. Sinister Wisdom does events. Leslie Lohman, uh, the museum that does uh, lesbian and gay art, does incredible uh, virtual events. Really, um, I hope everybody will put in the chat their favorite, you know, places that are accessible to everybody. And I, I hope and think that um, a lot of this is going to continue on post pandemic, whenever that is. Um, how do both of you feel about young women rejecting labels and not wanting to be called lesbians or dykes? Well, you want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. I don't care. You know, I think there's a lot of young women, you know, who would rather use the word queer. I think there are a lot of people that we would have called lesbians who identify as gender nonconforming or non-binary. And I think that is their choice. And I think I get a lot of angry comments when people write articles about eye to eye portraits of lesbians and call the people queer. And I don't have any control over these <laughs> young people writing the articles using the word queer. And I sometimes use the word queer and I know it upsets people. Um, but doesn't upset me. Yeah, I, I I say queer often to describe myself maybe as much as I say lesbian, just because it's, I, I've been doing it for a long time and it just seems more inclusive. It's just easier to explain somehow. Um, and I don't, I don't mind, I don't care what young people call themselves. When I was young and started calling myself a dyke, a lot of older lesbians were very upset about that. They didn't like it at all. Yeah. And did I care? No, and I'm sure these young people don't care what I think they call themselves either. So go for it. Right. Um, now I'm getting confused because there's all these questions in one line and there's, they're coming from two different places. Um, You're supposed to look in the ask a question box first. I know, but they're not typing them there. Oh. This, this audience is just uh, not following the rules and putting them all over the place. But there's, <laughs> if you're looking at, this, at the chat board, it's, it's filled with resources and websites and conferences like here's where you here's where you find the lesbians right um, i i always want to provide resources so if you like what's going on in the chat make sure to look in the notes and resources section of eye to eye which i worked at updating just like i worked at getting you some nice links although i i'm not taking credit for all the links <laughs> just some of them I, I'm not reading the questions, so you have okay. to. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody says, oh yeah, remember in Oklahoma when they wanted you to stay in the trailer and sleep on the couch with the cat and you ended up in town with that nice professor. Do you remember that? In Norman, was it in Norman, Oklahoma? Uh, I did not end up with the professor. I may have ended <laughs> up in the professor's home, just to clarify. 
Um, I have slept on massage tables. I have slept <laughs> in dusty garages. I mean, y you know, this was how we did it. We just did what we had to do. Yeah. I reached a point when I, where I, I needed to start staying in motels, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, just in the nick of time, people started putting together uh lesbian gay alliances on university and college campuses. And then I started getting those gigs and they put me in motels. So that was great. That's lovely. Yeah. Um, what do we have? Let's see. Mariah Burton Nelson would love to hear you comment on some of the photos as you show them, the people and the backstory, but I don't, I don't know if you're set up to do that, but Hi, Mariah. Um, no, we're not set up to do that um, because the only ones we have are the ones you already showed. Oh, I know. Let's show number 12. Okay. And this is one of my most um, loved photographs, I think. Uh, it's Priscilla and Regina. And then let's show number 13. <laughs> Have you noticed that in that photograph? This, that is awesome. I just had to show you that. So, um, yeah. Yes, uh, I just want to say you you really do resemble that that Butch Dyke who came into the luncheonette. She did look a lot like you. I'm so glad that just makes me <laughs> happy. Uh, did she have a pretty little face? Yes, she was very sweet looking. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Well, I don't think we're set up to give the backstory, okay. and okay. we're running out of time. And I, I want to do one thing, and then I'll answer some more questions. Okay. okay. Yes. So I'm going to ask myself, what are you going to do next, Jeb? Well, what I want to do next is. Um, make the Dyke Show available by digitizing it. The Dyke Show, m many of you may have seen, um, is what I was traipsing around the country with, a slideshow, as I said, with a lot of equipment and a lot of slides. And I would tape myself on a little cassette tape when I gave the presentation. Then I would listen to it as I went to the next place to see, you know, the he, if I could hear the audience reactions. And I kept all the laugh lines, so it kind of turned into stand-up comedy by the end. <laughs> so the um, thing I would like to do next is digitize all the slides, digitize some of the cassette tapes, and what I need and I'm putting this out to all you wonderful over 600 lesbians out there. What I need is a person who can sync the slides to the audio. This is a paid gig. If you know how to do this, write Dyke Show and your name and contact info. Because I have found, and I d used to do this all the time when I traveled, that if you ask enough lesbians any question or f needs to find somebody to do something, you do, you find them or you get your answer. Um, I have a lot of faith. That's great. Um, I hope I hope people take you up on that. I, there's one really good question here that I, I feel bad I've given short shrift to your filmmaking work, um, Jewel Gomez is asking, can you talk a little bit about making the Dell and Phil film? Well, I'll tell you something. Dell and Phil did not like it when I said queer. <laughs> Just <laughs> the, the, They didn't like that word at all. I had wanted to make that film for many years, and it took way too long uh, for me to raise the money. And uh, 
thank goodness I did, and I did make it while they were alive. Um, they didn't trust me in the beginning, not because I used the word queer. They didn't trust me because I had been part of the Furies, and uh, we had gotten some writing from them, but I had called them assimilationist because they uh, believed in working inside the system. That was their uh -huh. politics. Uh -huh. And so of course they didn't trust me, I, I, you know, but we spent so much time together making this film and they wanted a film made and the person who started making it for some reason, I can't remember, gave up or dropped out and I picked it up. So they were stuck with me if they wanted a film. And then we spent so much time together that we basically all fell in love with each other. So it turned out to be a, a wonderful, you know, experience. But you will, if you watch the film, which you can do if you still have Amazon Prime any night, um, I asked them what they thought about people who called them assimilationists and, and they put it in the film. And so it's their, they got their answer to, to me. Anyway, that's just a little backstory, but it reminds me of something else that I wanted to say, um, Allison. You know, you and I have both put our papers at the Sophia Smith Collection. Yeah. And I wanted to encourage everybody to think about what you need to preserve as a record of, of your own life and find a repository for it. And Debbie's going to put in a bunch of um, links for you of different archives that exist. And then I'm going to encourage everybody to tell their stories, to do oral histories, because my generation, you know, we're not going to be here very long. And as I said, I waited too long or longer than I wanted to, to get a film about Dell and Phil, which is a, a sort of oral history, but you can make an oral history on your phone. So I want all the elders, and that in, means people in my generation, to find somebody to tell their story to. And I want all the younger people to find an older person and do an oral history with them. And those links in there are going to tell you how to do it. But it's not hard. Anybody can do this and we need our stories. So thank you all for doing that. I just want to say one more thing before we wind up, which is that when, when you and I first started talking to each other back in the nineties, I think one of the things we connected around was the way that we both thought of our own work very intentionally as a kind of archive, you know, that we were both trying to make, real images of real people that were gonna, I mean, I know I'm making, I was making mine up, but I was always trying very hard to be accurate about how people looked and what they wore. But um, it was exciting to feel that I was involved in that project with you, trying to, do, you know, to document the world. And that grew for both of us, it grew out of the fact that there was no documentation before us you know, like with my selfie and like what you said about doing the drawings, you know, we needed to see it. So we had to make it. And we were conscious that having made it, we didn't want it to disappear because we didn't want the people behind us to be in the situation of not having it. So, yeah, and thank you. And, you know, you you made so much and i want to i want to do uh, i have something else could we <laughs> could we go to 14 please casey so in may your new book is coming out um the secret to superhuman oh, thank you jeff 
And uh, could we see 15? Apparently, one of the secrets <laughs> to superhuman strength is about to be explained to you by Allison. <laughs> this is from a little video I put on Instagram the other day. Uh, I've been putting up these little promotional videos like secret to superhuman strength, number 73. Uh, and this one is, uh, the secret is get wet, stick your head under a waterfall. I just find that a very helpful thing to do now and then. I advise everyone to try it. And, and uh -oh. you just did this the other day and it was really cold, right? Yeah, it was, that was all snow melt. It was quite brisk. <laughs> and um, I don't have it in front of me, but apparently you spent a lot of time uh, reading fitness magazines and following all the fitness crazes and this plays a part in this book which is a graphic novel yes yes but like all your work there's something very personal and very profound un underneath all of that i hope we'll see <laughs> Well, I can't wait. I'm definitely thank you. Thanks for giving giving the book that little shout out. And Jeb, thank you. It was so fun to get to hang out with you and oh. chat tonight. Thank you. Thank Congratulations you. on this beautiful book. This the, the, the it's hard cover. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It feels the photographs great. Photographs look even better. Yes. I want oh, I can do one thing. Yes, please let me do this one thing. I've been trying to do this on every single could we could we go to uh, 28, please, uh, Casey? Casey is part of the team at Anthology Editions that I got to work with to make this book. And I could not possibly be happier with how it turned out. It, it feels good. I told you earlier I was tactile. It's a tactile book. And then we we worked so very well together and we made so many decisions about the new book, even though it's a very faithful reproduction. And one of the decisions we had to make was what color should the end papers be? Well, I, <laughs> I wanted this beautiful purple and nobody else on the team was all that keen on it. <laughs> <laughs> but they let me have it and I'm very happy. And I think all the lesbians are very happy also. Yes. And uh, if we could have 29, I want you to know that wow. making this book was so much fun because we had to choose everything, including the kind of binding you would, do you see that little sort of checkerboard in there? Yeah. We, we got to choose that, you know, whether it was going to be checkerboard or not checkerboard. That's it's called the end bindings or something like that. But it was just fun. You know, it's just great to be choosing all these things. And then, um, uh, you know, and then we got to choose the cover material and, Anyway, you really need to hold it. You so, do. Yeah. Don't buy it. it. It also smells very good, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me say how much fun it was to do this process with, with Anthology. And, uh, you know, they are the ones who knew this would be a good time to reissue. Thank you, Anthology. That was yeah. brilliant. Thank you, okay. Alex. This was so much fun. Thank you, Jeb. This was awesome. Yeah. Good night. Love you all. Good night. Bye-bye.